larger plant. So what a larger plant does is it takes longer for it to flow through the plant, so there's a more likely chance that it would be caught and captured in the sludge. So larger plants normally capture more of those things. Um, although we're treating to a higher level, probably than the municipal plant um, would be here on, on a standard, the more sludge you take out, the more chance you have of catching that pharmaceutical. Thank you. Um, my, my questions are having to do with the footprint of this facility. And I think you just testified that the location of the plant is not shown on the plan. It's not shown on the plan. Do, do you have, can you approximate where it would be? Can you, uh, can you point looked, that on the plan? I've looked at various locations where it could go on the plant, on the treatment plant. Uh, the primary location would be on the northeast corner of the property, up close to the, up close to Route 202 and the church property. Um, so that in, in that area, we have uh, the footprint of the treatment plant, and from the perimeter of the treatment plant to the nearest proposed or existing side yard setback, front yard setback, building envelope is more than 250 feet. Um, a second location that we've evaluated is on the south central portion of it, below south of the stream corridor. There's an area in there that would be more than adequate for the treatment plant, including the buffer area. Uh, there's at least one other area on the western side that has sufficient area for the treatment plant, including the buffers. So I've identified at least three areas. Primary location was on the northeast corner, basically being the proximity of the uh, Route 202 and less existing residential units in that area, and less proposed residential units. We would have good access off of Route 202 for municipal and third party people to come in, have good access for uh, three phase power, all the other utilities that will be required in there. But there are three locations that I've identified. There may be additional areas on the site. And uh, the pump station, I imagine, would be at the, at the, near the bottom of uh, the grade. Yeah. Uh, down closer to the intersection of uh, 926 and South Main Street. Yes. Somewhere in that vicinity. So, you, so the, are you say, suggesting that the, the raw sewage would uh, flow to that pump station and then be pumped up to some distance away to the, to the treatment facility? Yes. Uh, and um, you had mentioned, uh, did you anticipate there was going to be one or two treatment trains? Oh, two treatment trains. But, but, but the thought was if you want to have room for possibly a third one, going to Mr. Hawes' questions with future regulations and possible additional needs for uh, treatment, you, you want to have room for them. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and would they essentially be identical in size? Yes. I just reserve a space for future excavation, and I try to keep all utilities out of it. So my internal yard piping, I try to keep one area clear. And, and um, the, um, so you would, you would need to, if you were to design this and operate it, you would need to have enough room for potentially three treatment trains. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yes, and, and it wouldn't be for a third treatment train, that would be an area for additional technology. But yes, when I design it, I don't shoehorn myself in, because I never know when DEP is going to require an adjoining development to tie in, or, you know, it becomes a regional treatment plan in the future. I always try to provide as much flexibility as possible, because I don't know what future boards will do. And the 250 foot buffer would be, would consider that additional facility or facilities for other other yes. technology. Well, when I did my layout, I included that area, and then I did a buffer zone extending beyond that. And and finally, the um, this goes to both the, the pump station and, and the treatment facility. Uh, they, they, is, is it a, an accurate statement that they could not be in the floodplain or or wetlands or the the uh, stream buffer that's required by our, our uh, ordinances? I would say yes. Could they go in there through a zoning waiver? Have they done that? Yes. Have people filled floodplains? Yes. Would that be where we're proposing it? No. And there's sufficient room in these open space areas, I'll call them, outside of those sensitive areas that are typically not permitted by regulatory agencies? Yes. That's all my questions. Thank you. Mr. Edelman, any redirect? I have no redirect. I have Presumed you would, Miss Camp, give additional questions. Um, 
Mr. Ebert, you mentioned that there's a, your recommendation is a 250 foot separation between a treatment building and a residence. Is that because there's odors associated with the treatment buildings? Yes, it, 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 it's a treatment plant. There will be odors associated with it, and that's a recommended buffer so that, that uh, houses aren't built up to or would cause a nuisance or impact any existing residents. So will the applicant make sure that this treatment building is also 250 feet from residents off of the property? Yes. And are there odors associated with pump stations? There's potential for odors, any wastewater has potential for odors, yes. So the pump station buildings were also, the recommendation would be that those buildings be located at least 250 feet from residences? No, that's not. It's only for the treatment plant, and pump stations are routinely located literally within 15 feet of a residence. But you are recognizing that there are odors associated with pump stations? Yes, so we, we try to identify locations that are as far away as possible. I try to have 50 feet, um, but I have designed them and haven't had issues with them, but it's wastewater. You don't want to put it right next to a proposed residential or existing residential house. How large, and I know you haven't specifically designed this one yet, but typically how large for this type of a system, this number of EDUs, would the treatment building be in terms of square footage? Well, the actual control building would probably be 30 by 40, the uh, treatment plant would probably be 80 by 40. Would what you train 40 by 40? So the total land area needed for the treatment building. The hard part is I can, because I can figure it according with the topography. So some of them are long and skinny, some of them are square. It's hard to give a you know land mass because some of them are spread out. You know, if it be on the southern tier, um, it would be a long long. If it be up in the northeast, it'd be more of a rectangular. Um, so it's hard to say. Is it you know? Does it fit the physical footprint without the buffer spinning within an acre? Probably does fit it within an acre, the physical footprint of it. When you include the buffer area, are you at two acres? Probably. Right. And there was some conversation about the use of the drip fields for passive recreation and whatnot. Would you suggest that if the board did approve the development with the use of drip fields, that there be some condition imposed upon the residents of the development that they, they cannot be using those fields for even walking through? It, it would be a great thing. Normally what we do is we have to have an access road around it. So we try to appease the residents, because you, you want to go, it's a beautiful piece of green lawn. So we have a walking trail that goes around it where they could do, but it would be a great idea if it were to be imposed that they couldn't. And, and education is the key. Is there something that's contained within homeowners' declarations with respect to restrictions on these fields? If you know, I mean, for ones you've been involved I, I, I honestly don't know, because by the time I'm done my approval process and I've left before the HOA documents are done. But, but as an expert in this field, do you think that that's a good recommendation, that if the board, again, were to approve the development, the use of drip irrigation, that they could impose upon the applicant to include within their homeowner's declaration such restrictions? Um, yeah, we're limited down to passive recreation or, or something that they can only walk through. Yes, anything that would discourage that, I would appreciate from a wastewater standpoint. And you wouldn't want to see actual trails throughout these fields, correct? The, um, the areas that are not wetted, I actually encourage trails to go around. Around, but not through. Yeah, unless I had a break, you know, certain times there's certain middle courses that aren't used, I wouldn't have a problem. And normally what we do is we actually pave a trail around there. Um, Upper Euclid Township has established trails around the Upland Farm disposal fields um, that will go around it, but they fence the actual wetted areas to prevent people from going in. So I always encourage active recreation around it. If we're gonna put a trail in for access, why not have the people there? Because people will follow the trail and not go off of it given the choice. You also talked about quarterly testing of monitoring wells. And you said that if there was an issue that you know the testing of those wells might reveal higher levels of certain chemicals. If that occurs, what, what happens then? What, what, what has to happen? Um, basically what happens is, is uh, when it's been in DPA, the, the professional engineer would identify it, come up with a corrective action plan. I don't know what it would be. Most likely the first thing it normally is, is it's, it's something's malfunctioning. Something is not programmed properly, a valve has broken, it's overdosing one field. So the first thing you do is an evaluation of the physical field. The next thing you do is an evaluation of the level of treatment coming out. Is it meeting the design? Um, and if it's doing both of that, 
and it's not malfunctioning, it's meeting the design, then you look for outside influences. And that's why we do upgrading and monitoring because it may not be caused by the drip irrigation field. It may be because of failing systems a half mile away that are polluting the groundwater table. So we clearly do it a, a detailed evaluation and, and that's why both DEP and the professional engineer are required to analyze it. There's not a recipe for what the answer is. I mean, is there any way to know that in that situation where a well, the monitoring well, reveals high levels of chemicals that shouldn't be there, is there also testing done downstream to make sure that the downstream wells and or streams aren't being impaired as well? Yeah, that was normally what would happen. And how do you, if that occurs, how, how do those wells and streams get remedied? I've never had it happen, so I don't know. But it would be no different than a gas station contaminating the groundwater system. DEP would become involved. It would take enforcement action against the polluter. And it would be remediated the same way gas station pollution or any other pollution that pollutes the groundwater and forms with the clean streams law. Thank you. Any other council have questions at this point? Any other parties have any additional questions? Sir, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. You're not his attorney, though, correct? No. Okay, then, then I, I can't do that, unfortunately. You're not a party, is that right? Correct. Okay, then I'm going to have to defer on that. Any further redirect, Mr. Adel? I don't have any. Okay, then, sir, thank you for your thank testimony. You. Unless the board has anything further, at this point, we'll take a 15 minute recess and come back with the next witness.